As the U.S. population ages, the proportion of patients who require high levels of health care, costing large sums of money, will increase. Improving the performance of the health care system as a whole is going to require a concerted effort to improve the care for those high-need, high-cost patients. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with David Blumenthal, President of the Commonwealth Fund. Dr. Blumenthal has co-authored a perspective article about this urgent health care priority. Dr. Blumenthal, you note in your article that the population of high-need, high-cost patients is actually clinically quite diverse, and that research is underway to segment that population into subgroups with similar health care requirements. What do we know about the characteristics of the key subgroups and the kinds of care they need? Well, Steve, you're absolutely right that there tends to be often a simplifying and a misimpression of who the high-need, high-cost patients are. They're not, for example, simply patients at the end of life, which many people believe. They are clinically very diverse population. One characteristic that many of them have in common is that they have multiple chronic conditions, three or more, and they often also have a functional limitation, an inability to accomplish some common task of self-care or managing themselves in daily life. The ability to feed themselves, to dress themselves, to manage money, to use the telephone, to accomplish the common things in living. For example, people who have three or more chronic conditions cost about twice as much in terms of health care as people who don't have three or more chronic conditions. And people who have three or more chronic conditions plus one of those functional limitations cost three times as much as people who have just the three chronic conditions without a functional limitation. So we know that there are these distinctions based on people's capabilities and underlying illnesses. Some of them are complicated also by behavioral health issues, and behavioral health problems add to the cost and complexity of illness regardless of what other basic features the illnesses have. Some people have very severe social needs. They don't have good housing or they aren't able to afford food and good nutrition for themselves or have no personal support. So there are many factors that flow into making someone highly vulnerable and ultimately very costly, very likely to use costly health care services like hospital admissions and emergency room care. One of the things that's very clear about the research on this population is that efficient and effective interventions have to be carefully targeted to the needs of the individual. One size does not fit all. And so understanding what the groups are in this population and their needs and how to meet those needs is critical to improving the care they get. So in your article, you cite the current statistic that these high-need, high-cost patients make up about 5% of the population. How big do you think the growth in that number is going to be in the coming years, and are their needs going to change at the same time? Well, one of the things that would predict growth in numbers of people who are in this population is that the demographic surge toward an older group, an older population in the United States and throughout the Western world suggests that more and more people will have these problems. This is not exclusively an elderly group, but it's disproportionately elderly. And as people get into higher age groups, over 85, for example, they're much more likely to have this combination of three chronic conditions and a disability than other populations are. So it's not exclusively a geriatric problem, but it overlaps heavily with the geriatric trend. You talk in your article about some program models that are already being tested. What are they and what do the most successful models have in common? What should we be looking for? Among the more successful ones are the PACE program, the Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, which is longstanding, is present in about 118 sites in many states, but has not spread as far as it could possibly have spread. Another is something called the Independence at Home Program, which provides comprehensive care for high-need, high-cost patients in their homes using primary care adapted to their home needs. There are several other programs, some, for example, that target transitions in care so that people who are moved from hospital to rehab or from hospital to home or from rehab back to hospital get a more intensive level and a more appropriate kind of care and screening. What many of these programs have in common is that they are tightly focused on a particular population with well-understood needs. They are multidisciplinary, that is, they involve physicians, nurses, care managers, social workers, a combination of care in a well-integrated, personalized team so that people who are caring for patients with these high needs and high costs know one another and work together. 
A third is the exchange of information, health information technology with the ability to move information across institutional settings and across care settings and to be shared by members of the team is a third important characteristic. And a fourth important characteristic is the engagement of patients and families so that they are on board with the needs of the care team and can assist and anticipate those needs. So both the Affordable Care Act and more recently the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act encourage better coordination of care across the spectrum. How do you think approaches to caring for this particular population are going to change given those drivers? Well, first, the point about uh, effects of these new laws and authorizations is really, really important because one of the things that they are moving us toward is a situation where the financial incentives facing healthcare organizations and clinicians are aligned with the needs of the population that they're serving and with societal needs. And instead of facing disincentives to reduce the utilization of care, these organizations, accountable care organizations, Medicare Advantage plans, Medicaid managed care organizations, and the still as yet to be defined alternative payment models under MACRA, all share the one key ingredient, which is that the providers and patients both benefit from reducing utilization and reducing cost. And that's a critical ingredient. As these spread, there will be not just a professional interest in caring better for this high need, high cost population, but also a very compelling business and financial interest. And that is going to focus a much larger part of our healthcare system on this particular population. That's going to liberate, I believe, a huge amount of energy and innovation to improve care for high need, high cost patients. And almost regardless of what we've learned up to this point, the interest and creativity of clinicians in this population. I think augurs extremely well for getting better care to them in the future. You do nonetheless talk about some potential barriers in your article, one of them relating to a topic you brought up a moment ago, the care teams. You say in the article that there's going to be a need for cultural adaptation as professionals assume new roles in providing care to these patients. So what kind of new roles are you envisioning and how much resistance from professionals do you think you're going to see? You know, physicians are still trained to believe that they should always be in charge, that they are the captain of the ship, and that they should and must assume responsibility for most of the care and most of the decisions that affect their patients. With this complicated patient population that needs so much care in between physician visits and in between formal health care provision, there's going to be a need to share responsibility for critical decisions about patient care over time. And to make these teams work well, the teams that seem to be important to caring for this population, there's going to need to be an ethos of collaboration and of shared responsibility that has been difficult, I think, to accomplish in almost every sector of our economy and in every sector of our activity. That is to get genuine teams working together. And while we have teams that work, for example, in operating rooms or in the provision of very tightly specialized kinds of uh, outpatient care, the idea that we have a care manager and a nurse and a social worker and a physician all working on more or less equal terms in terms of taking responsibility for patient populations, I think that's a novel thing for many physicians and one that may relieve them of some of the very, very arduous tasks that they have to perform in the absence of that help may liberate them to really focus on the complex clinical questions before them, but one that will be a little bit different from what they've been accustomed to in the past. Finally, the Commonwealth Fund and the four other foundations that are behind this perspective article have committed themselves to supporting work in this area. What kinds of work are you hoping to fund, and what kind of activity have you seen so far? Right now, we are focusing mostly on producing what we call a playbook, which will be a collation of the very best evidence that's available on how to care for high need, high cost patients, so that that evidence and the practical consequences and implications of that evidence will be available to organizations and clinicians that want to improve how they treat high need, high cost patients. And we expect the first version of that playbook to be available in the fall. We will continue to improve on that playbook over time, adding new dimensions, more specificity, and hopefully generating better evidence. 
We expect, I think, that we will be part of the process of generating new evidence on how best to care for this population, as well as thinking through what some of the policy needs are to make it possible for willing clinicians to use all the means at their disposal to provide better care. Some of our current regulations and legislation make it hard, for example, to flexibly use resources for non-traditional medical purposes like the support of nutrition, the support of personal care, the support of housing, which are very, very important in maintaining the health of this population. So we're going to be working on the practical requirements for caring for high need, high cost patients, but also improving the environment and liberating the clinicians and frontline providers so that they can do the best job possible. Thank you, Dr. Blumenthal.